to talk about his latest book, The Mission. So David has been a contributor to Clarence Jobs for a while. I don't know how he snagged you because he's pretty legit. He's very talented. And he also contributes to Clarence Jobs. So thank you so much, David, for taking the time to chat with us about your new book today. This is my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. So the mission, so you, this is not your first book, but it is definitely a, a meaty book. And it's a story that, again, I told you, I warned you before that this started that I'm going to be spending the next few minutes talking about what an idiot I was. I had never heard of Europa at all before I read this book. Is that a common phenomenon? Have you encountered that same thought before? Why is this a mission that a lot of people did not know about? Sure. So when I, well, I mean, when I started writing the book, one of my first um, priorities was to make sure I was writing a space book or a science book, however you want to describe it, for people who don't read space or science books. I wanted to make sure that um, in reading it, they they would learn along the way. You, you don't have to bring anything to the table. You don't need to know what Europa is. You don't need to know what... Um, the difference between an asteroid or, or a black hole. The book's going to do the heavy lifting there. So, so yes, I, I've, I've, I had never heard of the mission before I started writing about it, um, which is one of the cool things. When I was you know, going through the process of writing it, it was a process of discovery, and I allowed myself to get excited about this stuff. And I think, uh, I, I hope that it comes across in the, uh, in the text. It made me excited. I mean, it touched on something again, Europa. You don't even have to know how to pronounce it as I as for me. I don't even know <laughs> in order to do it. I'm like, what? Europa? Mm, I I sound like George W. Bush right now. I'm sorry. I apologize. No, like, what, no, is, no. what is this newfangled place? But it was interesting. And I appreciate that you so you talk about that. It's not, and I've had the same, you know, problem in kind of talking about the book too. It's not, it's a it talks about scientists, but it's not a science book. It basically profiles so many of these key characters and you talk about a lot of details related to their life that you generally wouldn't hear about or wouldn't know about. And I found that very interesting to see. Again, especially clearancejobs.com. We're a career site. We do career networking. Um, so just that aspect of all of the different paths that people took to get engaged in this program. So maybe, you know, speak to that a little bit. How did you decide who to profile and why did you take that approach to writing about writing this story? Sure. So that was a uh, that was an interesting challenge because I interviewed over 100 people for the book. Um, it took it took seven years to write. So I think I had just started writing for clearance jobs uh, or maybe uh, maybe I'd been writing for you a little longer than that when I when I started writing this book. And um, um, yeah, the more people you talk to, you start to sort of get uh, uh, overburdened with uh, with information. And and the the hard part is sort of like, I guess you could almost compare it to being a sculpt a sculptor, right? So you've got this big slab of marble, and you have to carve away everything that's not a lion. And and it's sort of the same process whenever you have so many people involved in a project. I mean, so I know a lot of clearance jobs readers are in are in the aerospace industry. So they know that these projects are not like two people or 10 people. It's like 10,000 people spread out across the country. And it's the same process for NASA, which, of course, obviously is the space part of, of aerospace. Um, I tried to stick with the most interesting people and the people who would, most, who would be most compelling um, in order to drive the narrative forward. So uh, one of the main characters is Louise Proctor. Um, she's a uh, she's a scientist at the Applied Physics Laboratory in um, in Laurel, Maryland, and she um, she had an amazing backstory. So when we think about scientists, we customarily think about scientists as people who, um, you know, they were born immediately wanting to explore the stars or whatever. They they graduated from high school at seventeen. They graduated from college at twenty one. They immediately got their PhDs, and then they started you know working for NASA because everybody there is a genius. But in fact, um, it, people have long and sort of tortured roads to get there. And one of the cool things about Europa is that it attracted people from all walks of life. So in Louise's case, um, she was an office supply saleswoman. She's she was the world's worst typewriter saleswoman. That's that's mentioned in the subtitle of the book, and. Um, she went back to, 
into her career as an adult, she decided, you know, maybe I want to, let me just take some correspondence courses because I've got some free time. And so she did. And it turned out that she, she loved science. And this was something that hadn't really occurred to her. And um, ultimately, she would go on to be one of the most important scientists walking the face of the earth today. And if nothing else, it's a, uh, it's one of those testaments to uh, sort of, um, you know, following that, that whatever path your uh, your personal journey leads you on, and, and there are other characters. So, and and characters who who you wouldn't necessarily expect to to come into play. So, John Culberson, who's a congressman or who was a congressman in uh in Houston, he doesn't represent like the Johnson Space Center part of Houston. And in fact, Johnson Space Center uh, doesn't even really deal with robotic spacecraft. It deals with um, astronauts and and human spaceflight. And and Culberson, he was just a space nut. He was just like a nerdy kid who just liked this stuff. And when we think about members of Congress, usually and politicians in general, I think we all have a pretty pretty jaded view of things these days, right? So uh, they're they're either there for the, the lobbyists' money, or they're there for very narrow interests, or their political party's interest, or whatever. Well, Culberson, he just liked this stuff. And it just so happened that he was the guy who could write the checks on the House Appropriations uh, Subcommittee responsible for NASA. And so he sort of helped usher this mission through. But it did take 20 years. You know, this was a 20 year project from sort of conceiving the mission through through eventually getting it approved. Um, and today it, it's going to launch in 2024. So we're we're close It's actually being built as we speak. Yeah, no, and I found that so interesting, too. It's going to take six years. So you really have to be, I mean, time, you, the time is, <laughs> right. you can't work for, you're not getting like a direct immediate return on investment here. Like it will take, you know, they launched the mission and then that was another key part of the book. I mean, you had to cover a span of decades here because it's not like we're talking about, you know, oh yeah, we're going to get this up and running in the next couple of weeks and right. it's going to be fine. Like, the decades that it took to to make this happen. So again, this is Lindy Kaiser and the senior editor of Clarence Jobs chatting with David Brown about his book, The Mission. So read it if you haven't. It is great. I I talked my last the last time about the soft buttery pages. It's just one of those books you just kind of you can have a relationship with, you can enjoy. <laughs> You can set it on your coffee table. We'll create great dinner party conversations once we're having those again. Um, but yeah, you had to cover a huge breadth of research. And again, as I, I love a comeback kid story. So I also appreciate how many times this project looked like it was going to fail. So maybe even, you know, kind of speak to that and how some of maybe these key characters that you profiled. Uh, how, I mean, how did that all work together with different people coming into the forefront? to pick it up at different stages. It seemed like it was basically a, a lot of tossing the ball forward. That, that, that's a really good way to describe it. And I'm probably going to steal that line for interviews going forward. But um, one thing that, that you'd mentioned earlier that, that I found very compelling about the story when I first started writing, and it's in fact, it's one of the reasons why I decided to write this book. We live in a world or a society that has puts great value on short-term gain, right? Like we don't just want to buy something, we want it delivered, you know, tomorrow or today even. Now that Amazon Prime will deliver today, right? Um, we don't we don't necessarily want to wait for, you know, uh, the last episode of a TV series. We want the whole season. I mean, when I was a kid, right, or when I was a young man, um, you wanted to watch a TV series. That was a year long commitment, and now it's like a one weekend commitment, and um, these were people who who were invested in a project that that can take an entire career, and in fact, a project that can take an entire career, and at the end of your career, it still doesn't happen, or it does happen, and you'll be long dead before you know the results of it. I mean, you become one becomes a scientist because they want to answer questions. Well, if you're a scientist who studies the outer planets of the solar system and you want to send a spacecraft there and you want to explore it. Um, you're very likely not to get these answers, the, the answers that you seek. Your entire life's work is going to be enabling the next generation to be able to get those answers. And I found that very moving. I mean, that's that's just sort of crosswise our 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 our, our cultural makeup. And I'm I'm certainly a short term kind of person. I want I want immediate gratification too. Um, I didn't realize when I started writing this book that it would take so long to write. 
Um, otherwise, I might not have uh, I might have been chased away from it. But yeah, so the outer planet. When we picture the solar system, we all picture the the wire and bead model. I'm trying to find the camera. We all picture the the the, the, the yellow light bulb with the little beads on wires that spin around, and that's the solar system that you learn in grade school. And um, what that model doesn't really depict properly is just how phenomenally big the solar system is. So it takes about a year to get to, well, it takes less than a year. It takes about nine months to send something to Mars. Um, the next planet beyond Mars is Jupiter, and that can generally take, and this is because of orbital dynamics. It's not just a, on a straight shot. That can that can take you know six years or longer. When we get when we talk about Saturn, that can take eight years. When we talk about Pluto, um, you know we're looking at nine and a half, ten years to get to Pluto. And in fact, to get the New Horizons mission to Pluto took nine and a half years, and that was the fastest object uh, that human beings had ever launched. Or, or actually, I think it might have been the fastest object human beings had ever created. Um, and it still took nine and a half years, like 54,000 miles an hour or something like that. So, yeah, this is not this is not the work you go into if you want, you know, to have answers tomorrow or to have sort of satisfaction tomorrow. It's the sort of thing that you just have to go into knowing that um, this is going to be um, a long term project and you're probably going to get a no on it. But but we you know what? But it's something that we can all relate to um, in a sense, because uh, particularly clearance jobs readers. Um, who I think I've come to know pretty well over the years writing for the site. Um, you know, these you, if you're in, if you're doing a defense department project, you're you're in it for the long term, um, and uh, and and uh, like a great many of our of our readers are building the very rocket that you know uh, Europa Clipper was designed to launch on. So um, I, I I hope that it's an accessible story from that standpoint. It's just the sort of thing where, you know, our, our heroes kept getting knocked down. When you do a 20 year project, you're going to get canceled along the way. I think that's almost like a universal law. No project ever started and then 20 years launched. It was canceled multiple times um, and our heroes had setbacks. And the only reason that this mission was approved ultimately is because these people stuck to it. They were committed to it and they saw it through. Yeah. And people had passion for different segments of the journey, which I appreciated. So like there were there were people that had, you know, they had this big picture goal, maybe of, again, exploring the outer planets or getting more focus on those areas. But their slice of the pie may, might be actually be very narrow, their focus or their role of what, um, you know, their job was focused on or what area of science kind of led them there it was super interesting to me. And like you said, not. There were a few people that you had the great stories of the kid who got a telescope as a child and yeah. just always had that passion for the stars. And I love those. But you also had, again, had Louise Proctor and you had somebody who had a path of blue collar jobs that led mm -hmm. their military, which led to NASA, which, led, you know, when they were trying to. I always loved how the government will find ways to fill its positions creatively. So they were like, hey, we're going to draft you into working for nasa to fill those spots so i just thought very interesting to see how people some people with a passion and a quest to get there and some people who just um ended up there and then developed that passion because of you know life circumstances that that led them there so i thought i thought that was really um yeah really interesting how did you get i know that you're interested in space I know this is kind of a passion area for you before i think before you launched in here but what led you to the outer planets and to some of these stories so um at the very start of my career all i covered was politics and then i ended up covering national security and uh if you just live in that world i mean there are a lot of great writers who just live in that world and they excel at it i was living in that world and it was depressing the heck out of me like it was like more of this like it didn't even matter what this was it was just always just one more thing and finally one day i decided well what do i like like what 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 what, what do i because i because I, I still love writing about this stuff and i still do for clearance jobs but one needs uh, uh, you know more varied interests right i'm um um and i said well what do i like and i said well i like robots and I like space. So eventually I found a book about space robots and that would go on to consume the rest of my career. 
but yeah um so it but but there was a lovely overlap because nasa is aerospace right i mean it's the boeing and lockheed all these people they're all part of this and and i've gotten to know a great many members of uh, the aerospace community because of this project so talk, i like to stir up a little controversy so i have to do it a little bit uh so mars versus the outer planets mm -hmm. so there is i mean mars is having a moment and if now i've read the book mars has been having a moment for a while right um did did any of that come up i mean i we have those budget battles and budget battles, you know, play a part of it. So actually it does, this book brought in some of that probably past experience that you had um, dealing with the national security side of things. Cause there is that government politics interplay. You don't talk about that in the book primarily and it's stories based, which makes it a little happier and more uplifting, uplifting to read, but it's definitely, um, it's definitely there. And that came into play with the Mars versus the outer planet stuff. So kind of talk a little bit maybe about, that how that narrative came to play and are are we all happy now because right. europe is happening and mars or is there still everybody's behind getting what they want right so so this was uh when i when i first came to the project i thought uh, this is this is going to be a breeze because everybody feels like they have sort of a solid foundation on what nasa is like everybody kind of thinks they, they 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 have a good picture and i was no different i thought yeah i got this and then I got into it. I went into my first interview on the first day. It was with uh, Louise Proctor, in fact. And five minutes into the conversation, I realized I don't know anything. Like, I have no idea. I had no idea about the cultural um, battle between the outer planets and Mars. So for people who haven't read the book but are going to be racing out to the bookstores uh, later today, um, NASA has always had a very, a very tight focus on Mars. Um, it's not always seemed that way um, because NASA has a very small budget. It gets one half of 1% of the federal budget. NASA is practically a rounding error relative to something like the Defense Department. And we don't think that because they have such phenomenal achievements and they do such, such you know, universally accessible and universally appreciated work. Um, How that relates to, Nat, to to Mars, before NASA was founded, uh, Werner von Braun was probably uh, sort of the, the, would go on to become the father of the American space program. He was a, he was a German scientist during World War II. He built the V-2 rocket. Um, after the war, he was basically sneaked into the United States. The Soviet Union and, and, and the United States each grabbed as many German rocket scientists as they could because rocket science was new. I mean, we didn't know how to build those things. We didn't know how to build a rock. I mean, Robert Goddard had built had built the early principled rocket engines, but overall, um, we just didn't have a sophisticated appreciation or our, our technological foundation or what we consider like the defense industrial base today. Just that 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 aspect of it did not exist. So, von Braun wanted to go to Mars all along. The Apollo program, the moon was like a, a, a pit stop. It was just a we're going to do it to make the politicians happy, but we're going to Mars. That's the goal. And that's always sort of been wrapped up in the, in the genetics of NASA. Um, it has always marched inexorably to Mars. Um, ultimately, uh, what we start seeing, um, NASA is partitioned in terms of how it spends its money. About 50% of the NASA budget goes to human spaceflight. So right now, that's the International Space Station. That's the Artemis program. And that's, that's the rocketry and, and things like that. That, that, that go into supporting those missions. And you've got about a quarter of NASA's budget that goes toward robotic exploration. So those phenomenal first images we saw of, of Pluto, uh, those amazing pictures from Cassini that we saw of Saturn's rings and, and the interior of uh, Saturn's atmosphere. And of course, you know, these beautiful images that we just got of, of Jupiter's poles, right? Jupiter has blue poles. When I was a kid, Jupiter was brown and tan and orange. And now it's like this vivid turquoise. Who would have guessed? But those sorts of missions get about a quarter of NASA's budget. Mars has helped in this area because, because we are one day going to walk on Mars. Every robotic mission to Mars is considered a human precursor mission. Um, it's a way of buying down risk for when those astronauts finally get there. And this is, this is very useful if you're a Mars scientist. Mars is also very easy to access. It's nine months away. 
we launch something, it's going to get there. Every two years, orbital alignment is perfect for launching a mission. And it just so happens that two years is a perfect amount of time to build a spacecraft. So everything just everything's just coming up millhouse if you're if you're uh, if you're Mars. If you are Europa, for example, or studying the the Jovian system, the Jupiter the Jupiter system, what you're going to run into is what's called the Jovian radiation belt. Um, to give you an idea of how big this is and how powerful it is, uh, so Jupiter is surrounded by a belt of radiation. Um, when we look at the night sky, we can see Jupiter. It's about a dot. It looks like a star. It's a bright star in the sky. If you could see its radiation belt, though, Jupiter would be the size of three full moons next to each other. It would be enormous in the night sky. Um, the conditions in the Jovian radiation belt are like the immediate aftermath of a detonated thermonuclear bomb. It's just deeply, deeply, a deeply punishing environment. And if you want to study it, well, it's hard and it's expensive because you've got to have radiation shielding or you've got to be very creative in how you design the hardware that goes into the spacecraft that eventually goes to Jupiter. Um, so if you're NASA, to bring all this full circle, if you're NASA, you have one half of 1% of the federal budget. You have you know, finally we have like a cool aspirational goal, an astronaut on Mars. How incredible would that be? Are you going to spend money on this weird alien ice moon circling a swirling ball of gas in space? Or are you going to invest in sending robots to Mars, which is going to make the job of putting those astronauts there a lot easier? NASA's making a very canny decision, I think, by supporting um, Mars exploration. And I personally believe we need to go to Mars. We need to send humans to Mars as soon as possible. I'm ready to launch that today. Um, it, it, overall, though, what that does engender, though, is a sense of, of, host, of hostility in the planetary science community. If you are a planetary scientist, um, it's a big solar system. You might study Jupiter, you might study asteroids, you might study you know, Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn, or Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, or Neptune, or so on and so forth, right? There are an infinite number of targets in the universe, and there's one NASA, and there's no money. So suddenly you see everything going to Mars, so many things at Mars that it basically needs like space traffic control. Well, yeah, you're going to get a little bit annoyed by that. Um, and that was one of the fun things that I discovered in this project, just how bitter the outer planets people were. Now, what ended up happening ultimately is, you know, the Perseverance rover just landed. So that was that was the big competitor for Europa. And Europa Clipper was finally approved. Now, to find life on Europa, Europa is considered the most likely place beyond Earth to have life. It's it's the most likely place beyond Earth to have experienced sort of a second genesis. And this is at the bottom of its ocean. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about that, but I don't want to bore anybody. That was no, I mean, I, I was like, man, you went really went full circle because we were like, we we're doing a lot of stories, we we're doing a lot of space. And it was like, is there a God? Europa is going to, I mean, that was like, I mean, they're, they're ask, asking some big questions um, here in the book. So those, those scientists, are philosophers as well it turns out because you got you talk about that um yeah and yeah i'd love to hear more about that or what you found about that like how the passion of that do you think that fueled a lot of the passion for this mission the the whole is there life on this planet aspect of it or was it just like we just need we need to explore because we need to explore every planet it seemed like some of they were they're probably competing pe different people had different perspectives on it but yeah walk through some of those passion points that led sure. people to pursuing? I would say that that, that overall, the, the life question is, is the primary reason that we're exploring Europa today. It's not the only world. So, all right, so to give some context for people who have no idea what we're talking about. And, and by the way, I can tell that you actually read the book because the last chapter of the book deals in everything that you're talking about. And the whole reason I wrote the book was for the last chapter of the book. So my hat's off to you. You're the first a uh, person who's spoken to me about the book, I think has actually read it. <laughs> I might be the only <laughs> one, uh, me and you. Um, so the life question, again, when we go back to NASA's budget, which is very small, and we say, how do we, what do we wanna do to engage the public? Uh, very early on, 20, well, like this was in the late 90s, uh, NASA came up with a slogan for why we need to explore Mars and it was follow the water. There was evidence from a uh, spacecraft that had previously landed on Mars that there might, and, and from satellites in orbit of Mars that said there might've been an ocean there a long time ago. 
and we need to know more. We need to follow the water because where we know we 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 have a we have one case where there's a planet that has water and that planet gave us life and that's Earth. So we know water and life have something in common. Seventy percent of us uh, of our constitution is water. So we know there's an important that's an important element to life. And then there and there so there was evidence that there might once have been water on Mars. Um, so follow the water became NASA's sort of motive motive force, um, and and they continued and and they did that for for many many years. Well, meanwhile, and this was in it was hypothesized in the late '90s, but in 2000 it was proven or discovered there is on Europa. So Europa, it's a moon of Jupiter. It's about the size of our moon, um, and it's covered in an ice shell. But beneath that ice shell is twice as much water as exists on the planet Earth. Europa is just one giant ocean. Um, it has, um, the way the ice shell works, oxidizes the ocean. At the bottom of that ocean, because of the way Jupiter and the moon sort of interplay, it's basically being squeezed, I guess you could say. That's just an easy metaphor to understand. Where did, that, where did the ocean come from? So Europa was this ball of rock and ice. But because of Jupiter and the interplay of planets, it's exactly like if you hold a tennis ball and you just squeeze it and squeeze it and squeeze it. Eventually, it's going to get warm on the inside. You're going to feel it in your hands. And the same thing happened with Europa about 4.3 billion years ago. Um, so that ocean has had a whole lot of time. Water touches rock at the bottom, like so where the bottom of the ocean um, touches rock. Where water touches rock, you get interesting chemistry. Um, there are hydrothermal vents at the bottom of Europa's ocean, just like at the bottom of our ocean. Um, there, there are organics on Europa, and this was discovered through remote sensing, through satellites observing this thing um, from previous missions. Ultimately, you have every ingredient you need for life. So if it exists anywhere, it exists there. And if you're NASA, well, first, if you're a Europa scientist and you saw Mars and people were like, follow the water, we're like, well, you, for us, you can follow the whales. Like, we've got it all. Um, and if you're NASA, you know, the life question is pretty engaging. It's a pretty important question to answer. Um, and it's something that the public can get into. Like it's something the public understands, right? We understand Genesis, right? We understand, um, you know, religion has been tackling this question for as long as there's been religion. You know, where did we come from? Where did life come from? How does life originate? You know, yeah, and, and there are all sorts of religious constraints in there, whether you believe it's no matter what faith you are. Um, philosophers have been tackling the same thing for thousands of years. Do, you know, do, are, are we alone? Where, where did we come from? The same, very same questions. Um, and suddenly we can actually answer that question. Like, because if there's life anywhere, it's going to be Europa. And if there's life on Europa, one planet or two planets over, that means the solar system is teeming with life. Um, and, and that means, I think I, the analogy I use in the book, you know, we're not like a single cactus in the desert. We're like a blade of grass in a meadow. Um, and you can even get some cool philosophical questions from this, right? Um, when I go to a restaurant and I order a fish, to the extent that one can morally justify eating meat or the flesh of another living creature, it is because our ancestors established our place on the food chain. You know, we eventually conquered the fish. The fish did not conquer us. Ergo, I can eat the fish. That's, that is the moral justification for meat eating. Well, if life originated on Europa, if fish swim in that ocean or whales or sea monsters or whatever, if I got a European fish, would I have a moral justification for eating it? Because it would not be related to our food chain. It is its own creature. Would it even be considered an animal? Because it has no relationship to the life on Earth. Um, so when you start thinking about those questions, those are kind of fun science fiction questions. But at the same time, those are questions that like we're going to be able to answer in our lifetime. We're going to have to answer these questions. I don't know that we're going to be eating the fish right away. But. I feel like your next book, you've just written your next book. It's got to be like a science fiction take on yeah. those questions. They go to Europa and they <laughs> life oh. comes back. What ensues? What ha what ha what what happens? How do, how does society respond to that? I'm I'm curious. I'm not going to eat the fish. That's for sure. I'm telling you right now. Not I, eating those. 
I have a feeling we would probably go to jail if we did eat the fish simply because like like having a possessing a moon rock, I think, is, is illegal because NASA owns all of them um, for scientific purposes. But it would be kind of funny to see some scientists start sawing into. Yeah. Like, <laughs> hey, I feel around. like I need yeah. I have earned the right. Jill, Jill wants to know if you would take a trip to Mars. I'm. I feel like I solidly know the answer to that question, but go ahead, David, would you take a trip to Mars? Yeah, I would. I would. I would, I would like to, uh, you know, I mean, so I'm kind of like Elon Musk, right? He said that he would like to die on Mars, but not on impact. And, and I feel the <laughs> same way. So I, uh, I would absolutely love a trip to space at all. Um, and I think that's probably something that might be accessible in our lifetimes. I will pro I'm 42 now, so I'll probably be a little too old by the time it's affordable for one to go into space. But I think my, my daughter, for example, by the time she's my age, will have been to space at some point. It just, it's just the advancement of the rate of advancement for rocketry and, and the state of technology for uh, like human space capsules um, and just the, the amazing rate of development that SpaceX is showing us. Um, I just think that's an inevitability. Getting to Mars, it's totally doable. I think Elon Musk is sort of going to force the issue. Like NASA is leaning toward the moon. That's what the Artemis program is. We're going to go back to the moon, and they say this time to stay. I'm not convinced. I had an op-ed, or it wasn't an op-ed. It was an essay in the Wall Street Journal saying that the moon is a terrible mistake. Let's go to Mars because none of the lessons you the, the argument is if we practice on the moon, it'll make Mars a lot easier. But in realistically speaking, and I hope I'm not going on this weird tangent here, but um, this is a hobby horse of mine. Um, none of the lessons you learn on the moon apply to Mars. The soil is complete or the the the, the regolith, the, the surface material is completely different. Um, there's no atmosphere on the moon. Um, in terms of uh, uh, composition, these these are not similar. I mean, they're similar to the extent that they're in the same solar system and originated from the same circumstellar disk, but they're not similar objects. You can have a long-term presence on Mars in a way that you cannot have on, on the moon. What would that look like? It would probably look like our expeditions in Antarctica today. Um, but they would not... I, I, and and one more question or one more thing probably worth pointing out is it's so expensive to do anything, right? We built the International Space Station for one reason, to go to the moon, right? Well, what happened was it cost so much money to build the International Space Station, there was no money left over to go to the moon. And so we've been stuck in low Earth orbit since, since the 90s. Um, if we go to the moon, there's no more money to go to Mars. So you, you're really choosing a target. And if you can choose a target, and if we can go to Mars with technology right now, why don't we just go there? That's kind of my take. Uh, I saw a comment, the main thing is to keep from destroying the Earth. I agree with that. And, I, and one of the cool things about NASA is that it's a unifying force, right? We can disagree on the, the moral justifications of, of various wars. We can disagree on uh, national spending priorities with respect to... For example, do we spend more money on, I don't know, uh, fundamental research for whatever, medicine, versus building more schools, versus building more roads, versus repairing? You know, spending priorities are hard to do, and they're not unifying in any way, shape, or form. But we see that first picture of Pluto, right? We see that first evidence of life on Europa, and suddenly we have a unifying thing, right? We see the first human being land on Mars nobody is going to say, eh, whatever, and change the channel. Nobody's going to do that. It's going to be a thing that I think we can build on. Um, and, 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 and I hope, you know, I, I hope that, that that's ultimately what happens. But, um, you know, I guess we'll all find out together. I love it. I feel like that's the ending point. If I was a smart person, I would end there. And we're way over time. But did, am I allowed to talk to you longer? Do you have more time? Yeah, by all means. Yeah, I thought this I was mean, an I'm hour, here all day, but, but yeah. I'm just like, I'm keep going. I have, so this is a good transition. Space Force, you talked about Space Force. Is the is influx of money from Space Force going to help any of these other NASA missions, or is it funneling money away from other projects? Is there 
or is this a good thing for space exploration? That's a really good question. And, and, and um, obviously we're going to have to wait and see for a lot of things. You know, you never know. And the short sighted and horrible decision would be, we can give NASA less money now because we have space force doing things. But one story that I describe in in the mission is about the space exploration initiative, or not space exploration initiative, I'm sorry, the strategic defense initiative um, in the 1980s. So um, in the in the 80s, we were deep in the Cold War, intercontinental ballistic missiles, you know, were threatening to destroy the earth, like like Christina mentions. And Reagan said, let's build a missile defense shield. Well, the best scientists and engineers got together and they said, well, how do we do it? And the question and the answer was, well, we got to put spacecraft in orbit with lasers. And they said, OK, well, how do we do that? Well, we need to miniaturize thruster you know, propulsion technology. We need to miniaturize computers. We need to improve microchip technology. We need to improve every single thing, communications abilities, um, uh, uh, just policies and procedures in general. Every single thing that you would need to improve NASA, you needed to improve this, this, this military program that had a $30 billion budget. I think it was, it was more than $30 billion. It was a massive budget, way more money than NASA had. It's the biggest defense department initiative in history um, and still has legacy projects going on today. Well, NASA didn't see any of that money at first, but all of that technology development eventually trickled down to NASA in the mid nineties. Like it finally arrived at NASA and was basically like a free Apollo program set on their lap. All that money, here you go. And so when we talk, when we get to that faster, better, cheaper era, when we get to those missions to Mars, um, those early ones, Pathfinder, remember that that was an extraordinary mission. I remember I was in high school, I think when it happened um, and, and, uh, Mars Polar Lander and Climate Orbiter both were lost, but we started getting spirit and curiosity or spirit and opportunity and then curiosity. All of those rovers were a result of money that had been spent by the Defense Department that trickled down to NASA. So my hope to answer your question is that the the Space Force will it's not going away. I hope that it's going to end up and it's part of the DOD. So it's going to get a massive budget eventually. It's going to have Air Force budget eventually. Can you imagine NASA with the Air Force's budget? Like, I mean, just, just the, I mean, what would that be, an order of magnitude more money than they have right now? That would be extraordinary. So if the Space Force took over research and development, or if there were, for example, a Space Force Corps of Engineers, right? And suddenly you have somebody who can actually build, um, I don't know, a moon base for free for explorers at NASA. First of all, that frees up NASA to do other priorities scientific exploration, sort of fundamental research. Um, but it also basically gives us money for a space program. I'm very, you know, I'm in favor of the civilian exploration of space. Um, I think that's, you know, we are, we are explorers. That's, that's what we do. And it's, it's probably, I would like to not fight wars in space if we, if, if that can be evolved at any, if at all possible. Um, but if we're going to have a space force, there's not really a whole lot of other reasons for it. So let's go ahead and uh, let's let's use that R&D money uh, for, for valuable purposes. Yeah, no. and the book did outline that well, how the SDI, the, all of that money, basically, it was basically, they created new realms of commercial off the shelf technology within space, which you never would have had before. You're like, oh, this, this, this is our, this problem has been solved. We can use this technology and then just build, layer what we need on that. So that's my segue to talking about the Army Combat Fitness Test, David. That's my right. last question. And everybody should buy the book. The mission. It was at Barnes and Noble. So let's not talk about why I'm walking around Barnes and Noble shopping. Forget that it's still open. Lindy Kaiser hangs out at Barnes and Noble. You can purchase the mission there or online, like like 95% of the rest of the internet. Get it on Amazon. Um, so buy the mission. But last thing, Army Combat Fitness Test. You're our favorite former sergeant on clearance jobs. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll find a way to promote this somehow because Army Combat Fitness has people love to hate this test. Yeah. So just a few seconds talking about why you st why you still care. So your you know, your military career is 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 long past you. Why do you still right. write about the Army Combat Fitness test for us other than we just love you and encourage you to do it. But as as a as a taxpayer, I look at the perfectly suitable physical fitness test that we had before the army physical fitness test, 
which every special forces soldier fighting today, every ranger on the battlefield, every paratrooper has taken the army physical fitness test, achieved a 300 or probably 300, 360, 330, whatever the extended score is. They passed it with flying colors, had reached a certain physical threshold and went on to do amazing things. As a soldier, just a regu- as just a soldier myself, when I watch somebody go from a failing a PT test to ultimately maxing out a PT test, you can look you can look them in the eye and see that is a that is an amazing soldier right there. That is someone who is in physical in fine physical shape. To take the Army physical fitness test, it costs three dollars, right? It costs nothing, and it can be and a PT test can be done at the drop of a hat. Anybody can train for it anytime. Push up, sit ups, and run. That's all you got to do. You got to stop watch. You're in business. The Army Combat Fitness Test. I, I, in this most recent piece that I wrote, you can buy the equipment to do it, and it's something like you know three thousand dollars. Like if I wanted to train for it at home, right? If you're guard or reserve, that's your only choice. There's no sled at, at Planet Fitness, right? The, 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 these things are. This is. These are absurd things that they're being. Uh, being required. It's like trying to solve a problem that didn't exist before you tried to solve it. And uh, it's costing us, it, it, you know, what I, I, don't, I don't even remember what the figure was. Now it's like 80 something million dollars. I think it was. I mean, this is yeah, a, it was it was yeah, it was millions of dollars for the for the. Yeah. And the terrain that you need to do it because you can't just pull across a sled, you know, pull a sled anywhere. So having the right field conditions right. and all of those aspects of it. I failed. I couldn't do a leg tech. I think I can do one now, like a year of training later. I literally trained. I, I took the test and I failed it the first time. Everything I I was like 83 or whatever percent of women. I couldn't do the leg tuck. Well, now, now, now they now they have the plank. Right. So I don't understand. Why do they do the if the leg tuck is that important? If it was that critical that we had to redo the PT test. Why are we getting rid of it? Stay, come on, Army, stand your ground. Right. What is this? They they have yet to return my request for comment. I have a feeling that at the office I might my name might actually uh, set off alarm bells. So it's I probably like a lot of like, I'm I'm army. I mean you know fake army. I was an army civilian, but I love the army. It's still my favorite. I was a PAO, so I love you know communicating. So I sympathize with like I know that there are people who care and thought like they were doing great things with this. Some CrossFitter out there was like, we really need to figure this out. But like you said, adding all the complexity without the data first is a problem, and that's the right. point because now they're asking for the data. Well, now we've already. I mean, now we're already so far in. Right. And now you want the data. It's like they had to have had those data sets before and knew that physically a decently fit person would still, again, female body types, leg tuck is not super easy. So right. like if they, if they, if they knew that going in, I feel like they had to have known that there was, I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't be opposed to the, the army combat fitness test to be some sort of add on test for X school. Like you have to be able to pass this if you want to go to airborne school or if you want to be in a combat arms MOS or whatever. Um, but I don't need a, an army dentist who's able to, you know, pull a sled and, 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 and do the leg tuck. Like I just need an army dentist to be able to, you know, fit in his uniform and clean my teeth. So that's, 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 uh, We'll see what happens, yeah. but I, I'm, I have a it's feeling. If it keeps the on giving, there's more, more ways to talk about it. More time. I have taken up enough of your time, David Brown, but I love you. It's been a pleasure. You can read the mission first and foremost. It is very interesting. Read it all the way to the end. Cause you get to that money part where NASA cares. Is there life? Is there a God there? Europa They're They're exploring these, these big questions and then also just read it for the interesting stories. So you can be passionate about science and passionate about other things. There are a lot of, again, the, the little nuggets of people's lives that you brought into it was kind of delightful and fun to read. And we all need a little delight and fun right now, in addition to, you know, all the things that aren't delightful and fun. So check out the mission. Thank you so much, David. Read more of David's writing at clearancejobs.com as well, because he is one of our delightful contributors. So you can read all of his Great writing at Clearance Jobs and read his book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. It's so great. Thank you. That always takes me a